welcome to Global Connections. I'm um, Dr. Patrick Bratton, your host. We're going to do something a little different today. We're going to have a virtual guest, and we're going to talk about some stuff that's of interest, but a little bit different than what we normally do on Global Connections. Our guest today is Dr. John Sullins, a professor of philosophy at Sonoma State University. And John does a lot of work on the ethics of artificial intelligence, and I thought this provided a way of us to talk about a lot of contemporary, sort of cutting-edge, controversial topics ranging from ethics, artificial intelligence, how this applies to things like drones and killer robots, and even the debate about, about sexual robots and other things like that. So wide-ranging discussion in the time that we have. So without further ado, uh, John, welcome to ThinkTech. Thank you. So um, you're at Sonoma, you're a professor of philosophy. Um, I mean, how did, how did you sort of get to Sonoma and decide to study philosophy? Well, um it's kind of a roundabout story, but I was working in the uh, in Silicon Valley for um, doing some consulting at Xerox Palo Alto Research Laboratory, um, and I got up there through a philosophy professor that I was taking at the time at um, San Jose State University, and um, just got really interested in technology philosophy, which is a little bit different than than standard uh, what people think of philosophy. But it's the application of philosophical ideas and values, and especially ethics, to the design of technologies. So while I was spending some time up there, I decided that I might as well just get a PhD in this um, this uh, topic. So I wound up at um, at um, uh, um, Binghamton University and finished up my PhD there. And um, after that, got a job at Sonoma State University um, teaching uh, engineering ethics, computer ethics, and um, regular philosophy classes as well. You probably get this question a lot, but I'm obliged to ask it. I mean, there's always been this rhetorical argument, sometimes at universities, about these sort of ethics courses that are applied to various majors or various professions. And, you know, you always have that, that quip that student, I'm sure you've gotten from students, oh, I don't need somebody to teach me ethics, you know, I know about, well, I'm 18 or 21 or whatever I am, I know all the ethics I'll need or something like that. I mean, what's your response to that? Because, I mean, you must get that, right? Yeah, there's, there's, um a lot of people think that there's not much of a topic there, but, but there really is, because ethics is um, not just your personal um, uh, moral compass, but it's also how do we design systems and, um, and uh, policies that allow us all together to behave in a way that's uh, pro-social rather than, than not. Um, we can build systems where perfectly good people can do perfectly awful things um, just because the system is what's the problem. It's not the, the members of the system. So it's really important that we spend time thinking about social systems, especially technological social systems um, that we have control of during the design stage to make more or less um, ethical applications of these technologies once they get released into the public. It's a little bit harder to change those things once they're out in the world, uh, much easier during the design stage. So then basically what you're saying is that, you know, once you've deployed the technology and you start using it, that's in many ways sort of too late to start thinking about ethics, that we need to think about the ethical dimensions of technology before you deploy them. I mean, how would you, I mean, how would you do that? I mean, how would you give an example uh, for mm -hmm. our watchers about how they, how they could conceptualize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, for instance, um, some, some of the projects that, that I, when I was at Xerox Park, um, we were building things that would eventually become what we now call, you know, the social web. And uh, a lot of interesting things happened there. We, we, we got to see um, some of the privacy issues that were emerging, and, you know, this was the early 90s when we were looking at this, and um, we were able to uh, suggest some, some interesting changes to the technologies as they were being designed. Um, I, just, I remember one where engineers thought that um, being able to track, you know, for instance, your phone through um, uh, uh, kind of giving a map of your location and everything you did during the day was super exciting to them because it was a really interesting technical problem that they were excited to solve. Um, but they didn't always real, realize the um, privacy implications and just um, uh, whether or not that's going to fit into the corporate culture at Xerox or anywhere else. 
um, those kind of things needed to be looked at by, by other people. Um, we had social scientists, we had uh, ethicists like myself, we had anthropologists, all looking at these technologies as they were built so that we could um, rethink um, uh, and suggest some design changes when, when there were um, issues that, um, that potential users found, found uh, not so um, exciting as, as the people who were designing the technology did. Hmm. I mean, you mentioned privacy issues. I mean, you, I'm sure this must have then come up in some of your classes, the debate between FBI and Apple and some mm -hmm. of these things. Is that something that you guys w would cover, you know, in this subject matter? Or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's probably the prime, prime issue of our, of our time. Um, the, the, big, the big issue is, is that, um, well, there's a couple of interesting things. With privacy, you tend to have... Um, uh, opposing values. So, for instance, you might um, you might really value privacy, but you might also really value security. And as it turns out, you can't really have both at the same time. 100% privacy would be a detrimental security, and 100% security is very detrimental to your privacy. So, um, the real question then comes when we're building a particular technology, which uh, what, where along that scale do we want to go with the technology? Because it's not going to be able to make everybody happy, um, just because these technology, I mean, these values come into direct opposition to one another. And this happens a lot in, in various technology designs, um, but most specifically in, in privacy issues. Mm. I mean, do you find that the students? I mean, one thing I'm always surprised at teaching students is that you know, we do see sometimes the sort of indications of generational shifts where, you know, one generation, hey, privacy is what you need. Another generation, well, hey, maybe I grew up in an era of terrorist attacks. I want security. I mean, mm -hmm. have you found as you've taught this class since the sort of dot-com and internet revolution that you mentioned in the 90s, have you found that student values have shifted over time or have they been pretty consistent on this debate between privacy and security? Yeah, they, they do shift. Um, so when I first started, the technologies were new and um, people were just very excited about them and, and um, I think many, of, especially student-aged um, um, people were, were pretty cavalier about it. They didn't really care much about the loss of privacy. Um, I think that's really shifted though in the last, uh, last 10 years or so as, um, as uh, Edward Snowden leaks and different things have come out and people have started to really realize how deep and pervasive the loss of privacy has become. Um, I, f I find students now much more interested in engaging in this topic and finding um, help, you know, be helping, they want to be trained to help make real um, progress in this area and find a, find a better balance between privacy and security. Do you find, I mean, when you're teaching, oftentimes, you know, it's useful to give concepts or uh, ideas to students that they can sort of operationalize to different situations and things. I mean, for dealing with ethics and technology, is there sort of a, I'm probably guilty of showing my sort of political science sort of leanings here, but, you know, sort of a, a concept within ethics that you often use for students to help them maybe question some of these, these issues about privacy, security, the use of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's quite a lot. So uh, uh, one way to go about it is to look at the, the classical ethical systems. Um, the top three would be um, deontology, um, utilitarianism would be another one, and, and then Greek uh, sort of virtue ethics. Um, these are great places to start, and I usually start with those in the class, but they're not a good place to stop because mm. traditional ethical systems were, were developed for a, a time when um, these uh, these real technological challenges were non-existent. In fact, most ethical systems don't even really bring up technology as a as a factor in the in the calculation of what's ethical and what isn't. So things have, have got to change, and and um, we're at a period where we really need to put our heads down and, and come up with new ethical systems that take technology seriously. And that's that's the so what I try to do is is move into um, a world where where we're thinking about values as something that you actually can use as a design um, uh, uh, aspect or um, or constraint within a technological system. So I, I see uh, personally, I see ethics as as a technological system, and I think it always has been. But 
earlier philosophers didn't really see that. Um, they, they, they saw it really as, as something that you do sitting in an armchair and, and, and kind of imagining a more perfect world. And um, I, don't, I don't really see that. I think that, that ethics today is really about experimentation and trying uh, new systems um, and, um, and being ready to back off of, um, of designs that you, that you might have thought were good but turn out to not give you a, um, maybe the privacy security balance that, that you were after. Um, and being willing to rethink that and go back to the drawing board and add, add or subtract um, various, uh, various things that you find ethically valuable. Okay. We'll, we'll take this conversation in a couple of case studies in a second, uh, but we'll have, a couple of, we'll have a short break right now with a couple of announcements. Okay. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not otherwise have met, helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. Aloha, my name is Justina Spiritu and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers, including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. Aloha. Welcome back to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton. I'm having an interesting discussion about ethics and technology. Dr. John Sellens of Sonoma State University. Before our break, John mentioned something pretty or something I found very interesting about thinking about ethics as sort of a system of technology and leading, uh, talking about a lot of the challenges that new technology has for ethics. And so one of the things I wanted to talk with John about is some of the research and writing he's been doing on some pretty topical sort of hot topics right now at the moment. I mean, if we think about technology and ethics, I mean, I think one that's been sort of omnipresent the past 10, 15 years is this sort of debate about drones and warfare and about the rise of quote unquote killer robots. And I know this is something that John's been writing about in the past. So, I mean, if we're looking at this, what's, what's the move here? What's the reason behind this large spread sort of uh, transnational activist network that's wanting to sort of ban uh, killer robots, which at least, you know, if I put on my IR hat here for a second, I mean, it's a similar sort of people in MO for the people who, tried, who w did the movement about banning landmines about, you know, 10 or 20 years ago and actively still doing that. I mean, what's the case sort of against killer robots here sort of ethically? Yeah, well, you're right. The... Um in fact, a lot of the same people who are involved in the landmine ban are involved in the autonomous robot ban. Um, and, and there's an interesting connection that, that I think a lot of people don't, don't catch. Um, the landmine ban can be, um, you, can, you can find a way to circumvent the landmine ban by, um, imagine building a, a military robot that um, is of small explosive, so this is a small little machine, and what it can do is um, is spot targets and maybe crawl over to them and detonate itself. Um, so, basically, what this thing would be in in all practical purposes is a smart landmine, um, and it would be able to do things that currently are banned by the treaty. The the main reason landmines are banned um, as a weapon of war is because they're persistent and they're non-discriminatory. So um, they last long after the conflict and they, and they kill anyone or anything that happens to um, come across its path. So imagine you build this small little autonomous robot. You could build it this afternoon with the right technology. It all exists. Um, and this thing could uh, sort of turn itself off and discriminate its targets. And so can you, you see how, how this starts to be a landmine that is, um, not really a landmine, right? Um, so it's not, it wouldn't be banned under the current treaty. Um, so, so this has got some of the people that are, were involved in the landmine treaty interested and they want to extend 
uh, autonomous robots into this ban so that it's not a way for unscrupulous militaries to get, uh, or, you know, as a, as a practical way to get around a landmine ban. Okay. Um, what is the issue, though, about, okay, I get the, the issue on landmines. What's the issue about killer robots? I mean, wh how does that raise any... I know this might sound like rhetorical, but how does killer robots, in a sense, raise a rhetorical issue? I know we've all seen the Terminator, and we know it's bad, but, you know, if we're maybe not to have been science fiction buffs, and we don't know that killer robots are bad, I mean, what's the ethical case against killer robots? Well, the, the main case against them is that uh, an autonomous um, machine, so, so there's a distinction between maybe the drones of today. So the drones of today have a pilot, um, and in fact they have a number of different people looking at the screen and watching and deciding who is going to be a target and whether or not the missile is going to be fired. So there's quite a lot of human involvement in that decision. Um, what the autonomous robot ban is, is working against is, is on the very near horizon there's going to be machines that um, aren't going to need this kind of human input. Um, they'll be able to find their own targets, they'll be able to distinguish, well, they hopefully will be able to distinguish between different kinds of targets, and then they will go through their programming and choose the best target, given the situation that the machine is in at the time, and then be able to, to execute an attack on that target, um, all without any human, uh, direct human in intervention. Um, so this, this is the thing that, that tends to scare people. They don't want, uh, they feel that like it's, it's uh, for instance, there's an argument that it would be, maybe it's a, a, a human right not to be killed by a machine, you know, not to, not to be killed indiscriminately by some mechanical process. Um, we've already gone down this path, this kind of reasoning with the, with the landmine issue, and, um, and it, it just dovetails right into the autonomous robot issue. These are just more complex systems that will make decisions that will wind up um, with, uh, with people losing their lives um, without any direct human contact. Um, that is, uh, by, by many people's um, uh, estimations, uh, an unethical outcome. That's a, kind, that's a new kind of warfare of which we've never really experienced yet on the planet um, that would that, that raises questions, um, and a lot of people would like to see it just uh, banned outright before we even experience the first one of these systems, uh, rather than waiting for some atrocities to happen and then banning it later. Does this raise, I mean, you, you talk about the near horizon, but if we're maybe on the far horizon, or maybe not that far, I mean, does it also work the other way as well, is that if you were imagining sort of this effort to sort of demand a lot of warfare in terms of pilotless aircraft and things like that. I mean, are there then ethical situations about having robots making decisions about killing other robots? I mean, because from a kind of a practical human perspective, well, that's great, you know, it's just machines killing each other, you know, nobody has to die, and so on and so forth. But if you're starting to give machines like the ability to make decisions about killing other machines, does mm -hmm. it then also raise ethical issues about killing those machines? Right. So. Um so yeah, the, 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 the pro side, the pro argument for autonomous robots um, from an ethical standpoint is that, yeah, in, in a lot of ways you, you remove um, a certain class of humans from the potential target list. So, so all, um, all of the soldiers that we currently put in harm's way, um, the pilots and the, the uh, uh, Navy personnel, I mean, all these people could, you could, um, you could remove many, if not possibly all of them, from, from harm's way. Um, that doesn't mean that the people who find themselves on the battlefield, um, all the uh, civilians and, um, and uh, people that just happen to be there, and of course our, our targets who would be there as well, all those people are going to still suffer and, um, and uh, experience violence. But, but at least we would remove a lot of, a lot of um, uh, other people from the equation. So that that's the that's the pro argument for for this. But um, but one of the one of the problems, an interesting thing that you brought up is is of course we're not the only military interested in this. In fact, every military on the planet is is uh, racing forward with this technology. Um, so it's very likely that these machines will come into contact with each other. Um, so one uh, one possible problem with that would be imagine a um, Two, two, two 
powers that are maybe in a in a cold war sort of situation with each other, um, and their machines uh, are playing chicken with each other out maybe in the um, China Sea or something, and um, and they start uh, they go through their programming and then they start shooting. And yeah, it's just machines that are that are initially being destroyed. So mach uh, machines destroying other machines, maybe underwater, un uh, autonomous underwater aircraft. I mean, um, craft and and autonomous flying aircraft. Um, all these things kind of uh, starting a little little rumble out in the sea. Um, that's great. Nobody dies. We just lose a lot of machinery. But something like that can can escalate very very quickly. Mm. Uh, and then, um, so if we're talking about large superpowers and, and some kind of mechanical shooting war starts out in, the, out in some frontier somewhere on the planet, this could start dragging in everybody else and, and large-scale military actions. Um, and that would have all been started by mechanical programming, not a human involved, right? Interesting. Like I mean, we would get involved really quickly. I mean, a kind of a doomsday sort of machine device in a sense, or dead hand sort of device danger, right? Yeah, but but not not so much as in the machine decides to start start a nuclear war. It's it's more of these these very simple little machines out out just somewhere out in the out in the middle of the ocean. Um, they're not very complex machines, um, but their interactions, their simple interactions, can cause complex um, hmm. uh, interactions, which could drag in. Uh, the larger weaponry and um, bring us into a political situation that that could get um, you know out of control really quickly um, and and this this would be the an anti argument against uh, autonomous weapons because we don't know you know it's it's hard to it's hard to tell like when you have a few programs running on your on your uh, computer it those they cause crashes right um, computer ever ever is perfect so imagine different military systems which are designed to thwart each other and to lie to each other and to um, and to uh, try to get away with different things imagine those kind of systems in competition with each other and you can see all kinds of weird unforeseen system crashes right that mm -hmm. could um, drag us into a real shooting war um, against everybody's best intentions that's a little scary oh. <laughs> What, coming back to an earlier point that you made about kind of going back to the roots of ethics, I mean, you know, when I, I teach a lot about warfare and, uh, and security issues, and one of the things we always start off with in sort of debate is sort of, you know, just war theory. I mean, does just war theory have anything to say about, about this issue and about uh, autonomous and weapon systems, or is it just too old? It wasn't aware of technology here. Yeah, well, it's, it's a very important thing to pay attention to because at least all, uh, all of the professional um, armies on the planet have some uh, pay some attention to just war theory as a way to um, guarantee, um, to the best of their ability, uh, an eth ethical behavior in in the um, starting and ending of wars and in the um, and and in one's actions within a war itself. So, just war theory still has a, a huge role to play, especially amongst professional soldiers. Um, and there's so there's two arguments again. Um, there's there's people who argue that um, just war theory would not allow for autonomous machines because um, they don't have the proper um, um, procedure to reason ethically and especially virtuously about um, decisions made in in a warfare context in the same way that a that a natural human um, could do and and would would supposedly be better at. Um, but I've also heard arguments that 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 um, one major problem with warfare today is that uh, um, most soldiers that find themselves in these situations are not following just war theory and maybe have never even heard of it themselves yet. And um, there there there's a lot of unethical behavior that happens in warfare itself. So humans are terrible at this and um, and have been uh, throughout human history. And so the argument would be add autonomous machines in there, and um, an autonomous machine, for instance, doesn't have to worry so much about its own self-preservation. So if there's a uh, a problem, it doesn't really know if a target is is an innocent civilian or a military personnel. You could send a robot out and just test, see what happens. Does that one get destroyed? If it does, that's probably a military target. And now we can fire at it. 
Um, you wouldn't want to do that, and you couldn't do that with a human soldier, um, but you can do that with an autonomous weapon. Um, so the argument is that, that these machines would be able to make calmer, more rational decisions on the battlefield, um, which would lead to far fewer um, uh, civilian casualties and just a greater adherence to the laws of war and the rules of war and um, treaty adherence. And um, for instance, they would have the ability to know exactly their location on the map. Are they in a free fire zone or not? Their behavior will change instantly um, based on their location. That's something that, that is much harder to do with, with humans. Uh, we get lost. We don't really know our exact uh, situation. Um, so machines could, the, the argument is that machines are, because they're machines, would have mechanical reactions, um, which would be more in line with legal and treaty and, um, and ethical uh, behavior than humans who are worried about their own self-preservation and their own self-interest are, have a harder time doing. Okay, interesting. I mean, you know, machines wouldn't get angry, right? They wouldn't say, yeah. you know, you know, my buddy got shot, so I'm going to take it out on you, or wouldn't get stressed out, and so things yep. that obviously would lead to atrocities, right? Yeah, exactly. They're not they're not going to have any of the emotional triggers that usually lead to atrocities. So they're not going to they're not going to rape. They're not going to um, uh, seek revenge. Um, they're just going to follow their orders exactly as they're programmed, right? That's the argument. Interesting. We, we only have a couple minutes late left, but I wanted to segue uh, to another topic that you've worked on, which will seem very different than killer robots, but this debate about banning s sex robots. And um, I mean, this is something I found intriguing as I was reading some of your writings and some of the stuff that you were debating about. I mean, is this a, a similar sort of movement to sort of preemptively sort of ban sex robots? Yeah, it is, actually. So, so some roboticists who... Um who take us up on the offer to make love, not war, um, still find themselves getting in trouble. Uh, um, as it turns out, um, um, there's a lot of people who feel that um, uh, when we, we can take this kind of same kind of technology that you would use on a battlefield and we can, we can move it into the bedroom and um, uh, build all kinds of interesting, weird devices that, um, that people will find titillating. Um, but the, the problem, the ethical problem is that um, uh, what, a couple things people fear. One is that, that if you take a look, just sort of Google sex robot, um, I did not tell you to do that. <laughs> right? um, and what you'll see are machines that are, that are very much designed by men for men's uh, interests and for men's pleasure. And they are the absolute total objectification of, of the wimp, uh, female form and um, and uh, you know it's, it's just uh, it's it's pretty easy to see the ethical implications of a society that kind of gravitates towards uh, you know imagine imagine your your son bringing home a, a big expensive sex doll um, into the house right instead of instead of instead of uh, following normal social norms um, so that's a, that's a problem. It's, there's, there's many really good uh, problems within feminist ethics that we have to pay attention to when it comes to sex robots. Um, and then the other, option, the other problem is, is that people feel that these things will become so compelling that humans will not be interested in each other because humans are filled with flaws and foibles and um, it's hard to get along. Um, but imagine a, a machine that's just programmed to... to love all the terrible things you do so it it loves that you that you uh you do the the uh, toothpaste from the middle um doesn't care at all in fact that's what makes it really like you um it, it, it really loves the fact that you like to just sit on the on the couch and drink beer and your t-shirt um that just makes it really happy um so it's hard to find another person that will behave that way but machines would so they won't challenge you to be a better person they'll just uh They'll just love you for for the mess you are. Interesting. I mean, wouldn't the, the counter argument be that you know people you know sort of from from time immemorial have worked on sort of 
you know, po pornography or sexual devices or anything like that. So, I mean, the, you know, the, the argument would be, you know, how is the, you know, we don't have a problem, say, with I don't, vibrators or something, right? Vibrator, that doesn't raise any ethical issues. So, mm -hmm. you know, sex robots, just a really elaborate sort of version of that. And so there shouldn't be any ethical issues with that. I mean, is that, a, is that sort of a straw man argument or? No, I, I think that's a, that's a really good point to raise. Um, so I think one of the one of the main problems with the sex robot ban is I think it's it's different and a lo, you know, much less compelling than the than the autonomous weapon ban. So the the sex robot ban is um, uh, seems to me very uh, way too early because because we, we can't hardly build these machines anyway. Right now they are just um, uh, uh, just a just a a kind of sexual uh, toy that maybe chats to you a little bit or um, moves a little bit so it's just a just kind of a, a more advanced and super expensive uh, love doll of some sort um, so so we're, we're not really at the stage where these things can walk and talk and hang out with you and um, live your life with you the way a, another human mate could and so I, don't, I really don't see them as, as something that's seriously going to be in competition. You know, humans aren't really going to be seriously in competition with these things um, for some time. Maybe that'll happen in the far future. I, I really don't see it happening within, within 100 years or more. Um, but uh, so maybe, maybe in 50 years we should probably revisit this ban. But, uh, but right now these are just kind of jokey toys and um, hardly worth... Uh, worth spending too much time uh, worrying about, um, except for the, the, the fact that they play in, they're currently playing into kind of an unhealthy um, uh, objectifi objectifying kind of sexuality that we as a culture really need to work on, not only with sex robots, but through every, every other aspect of our culture as well. Okay, interesting. I mean, not easy questions to solve anytime soon. Um, I'm, anyways, fascinating conversation with John. It's all the time that we have uh, for today. But thank you for joining us here on ThinkTech. You're welcome. It was very fun. All right. And that's all we have for Global Connections. Join me next week. And thank you to Jay and Zuri and Nick and the whole ThinkTech team here for keeping the show on the road.